Good evening, everyone. Shana, welcome. I certainly do apologize for last week that I could not make it, but I know you enjoyed Reverend Hanny. I appreciated all the kind remarks that you made about that class last week, but my <clears throat> computer went on the fritz, so it had to be taken care of, and it just didn't get it done in quite in time. So um, we worked hard to get it done, but it's good that you had Reverend Hanny, and he asked me to tell you because he's on, he'd be gone for the next two weeks, so he won't be with us this tonight nor next Wednesday. And he said that he would answer your questions when he comes on when I'm on that after the, these two weeks during the question and answer session. He said he'll answer some of your questions. Okay, we're going to begin tonight, but you know how I always start with the special prayer in Aramaic, where I say, Al Haile Maran Ishua Mishiha Misharenan Milap Milte the Mari Alaha Haya. All right. We're going to continue where I left off, well, two weeks ago in the book of the Revelation. We're in chapter seven. Before we start chapter seven, though, we're going to go back a little bit into chapter six because there's something more. I did touch on it, but I didn't develop it. And that is in chapter six, when it mentions that the sixth seal was broken. The sixth seal was broken. So let me uh, take care of something right here. All right. Okay. It's this strange expression when it says, and the kings of the earth, verse 15 in chapter six, and the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders of thousands and the rich and the mighty men and every bondman and every freeman hid themselves in caves and in clefts of the mountain. I explained that to you. And said to the mountains, now this is the men that are talking, these people that are fleeing from what? because the stars from heaven fell to the earth. In other words, a catastrophe in the heavens. And it says, and it rolled separately and every mountain and island shifted from its resting place. This is poetical speech to say that terrible, awful things were happening to the earth. This is what it's saying. And this is why the kings of the land and the great men all began to hide in the caves of the mountain and they were saying to the mountain and to the rocks fall on us in other words the rocks to cover the hidden places where they were where they were hiding so that's why they were talking to the mountain and to the rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him this is what it's saying, from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. And what I mentioned to you is that the lamb has no wrath. These are the men saying that. Even when we talk about the wrath of God, when we're reading the Old Testament, God has no wrath. If you notice, that even though, even though Jesus picked up on the same type of preaching that John the Baptist was declaring, he did not declare exactly the same thing as John the Baptist. John the Baptist was warning the people and saying, who has told you to flee from the wrath that is coming? That, that is the old understanding of the mind, what they people thought was the mind of God, that any type of catastrophe, any loss in the war, 
how if they were defeated, anything like that, was always because God was after them and it was the wrath of God and punishing him. And in the ancient world, all kings and people, their thoughts were, whether it was the God of Israel or any of the gods that they had in those days, in the ancient days, when any catastrophe occurred, earthquakes, terrible thunderstorms, floods, anything like that, it was always the anger and the wrath of the gods, regardless of what belief you had in those ancient days. So this is why they're crying out because of, of the stars have fallen from heaven. This is very dramatic. And what it's saying is to hide from him the wrath of him who was on the throne, but basically the wrath of the lamb. The lamb has no wrath. It does not belong with a lamb. The lamb is always noted for meekness, gentleness, never fights in that sense when they're shearing, all that stuff. They, they bend to it. They bend to it. And this is why Jesus is known as the lamb of God, because of the meekness he represented. That's why it's a part of his Beatitudes and a part of his other teachings. Even when he talks in the first beatitude, the poor in pride and the, the people who are not always judging others, the non-judgmental, the kingdom of heaven belongs to you. Meekness, meekness, and it doesn't mean weakness. Meekness means the ability to bend. Gentleness, that's all it means. And so when it says the wrath of the lamb here, these people are saying hide us from the wrath of the lamb because they're interpreting all the bad things that are happening as a result of the wrath of the lamb and him who sits on the throne so god does not have wrath and god does not and the lamb has no wrath either so I wanted you to get that clear. This is why I don't read the book of the Revelation because people misunderstand it. If you want to get a good misunderstanding of God, just read the Bible surfacely and you'll get a wonderful misunderstanding about God, about Jesus, about everything because they said things with the Near Eastern customs, language, idioms, all that. And it, we need to quit watching through western eyes we need to read scriptures through eastern eyes near eastern eyes and in particular aramaya aramaic lishana aramaya the aramaic language and the idiomatic expression because it clarifies everything and here you have to understand the mindset of the ancient world and the ancient people and how they interpreted all kinds of catastrophes always blamed it on the gods that they were bringing it it's their anger they're trying to correct us etc so and people still have that attitude i know people today who still think that when things go wrong oh god's after me or oh where is all this coming from remember i told you in the beginning when the lamb broke the seals there are seven seals what he breaking the seal means breaking the hidden things in the subconscious when the seals were broken this was in the subconsciousness of humankind the four horsemen all the, the catastrophes we bring it on human beings bring it on don't blame god hmm? and the lamb has nothing to do with it it is because of not following the lamb nature, not following the spiritual principles and laws of God, spiritually I'm speaking. And because when I use the word laws, people always think legalistically, and I don't want you to think that way. I want you to understand it. The laws of God, I mean, the principles, the spiritual principles, the spiritual laws, and the spiritual laws are meekness, compassion, love, understanding, that's the spiritual laws. Those are the spiritual principles. And they are a part of us. But instead, we allow the subconscious things we have 
tried to sit on, but they come up anyway, until they are taken care of. And this is what it's talking about here. So the lamb has no wrath. Now, I, now I explained it in a more fuller way for you. Uh, and, and who's saying it? These people are saying it, not God, not Jesus, all right? Now we can go to the seventh chapter of the book of the Revelation. Because the sixth seal was broken. So we only have one more seal that is to be broken up, the seventh seal. But instead of going to the seventh seal, which doesn't start until we come to the end of the chapter and, and the first verse of chapter eight, verse one of chapter eight is when the seventh seal gets broken. So, so what, 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 is this, what is this seventh chapter then? This is an interlude, meaning something between the breaking of the seals, something else is going to happen. And that's what you have to understand. And this is still the second vision. It includes this interlude, which is the seventh chapter, okay? Remember, uh, I gave you the verses for the second vision. The second vision started with chapter five, and it starts at verse 11, and it goes through to eight one. That's the second vision. The third vision, which we haven't got to, uh, gotten to, not until we get to chapter 8 and verse 2, that starts the third vision. There are seven major visions, which incorporate all these other visions with interludes and different expressions, okay? So now, let's continue. This is an interlude. And after these things, I saw four messengers. Remember the word angels, if you're following it in scriptures, the word angels means messengers. That's what it means, malache. That's how we say messengers in Aramaic, malache. So the malache, he saw four malache standing on the four corners of the earth because they all thought it was just one flat piece of land and there were four corners. <laughs> so there was a messenger at each corner. All right. So after these things, I saw the four messengers standing on the four corners of the earth. Hold what they were doing something. They were holding the four winds of the earth. In other words, these winds from the north, from the south, from the east, from the west. These winds were ready. In other words, a torment of winds was supposed to come. Winds in Aramaic here and in the Near Eastern understanding of imagery, winds coming on the earth means tremendous changes, shifting everything. Winds shift everything. They move everything. And to have all four corners holding back these winds meant there are terrible winds coming to create confusion, chaos, and shifts. That's what it means. That's why, and it's been using imagery, Near Eastern imagery here, this vision. They were to hold, and the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. No destruction, please hold them back. And that's what the angels were doing, the messengers. And I saw, because he's looking up and he sees all this. And then he looks at the earth and sees the four messengers. Then he says, I saw another messenger. And he ascended from the direction of the rising sun. Okay. So a messenger rising from the east, even though these other four were holding back the winds, this one arose from the east. Anything arising from the east generally is good. Anything coming from the east. And it was a messenger. So what, what, what did he see? 
from the direction of the rising sun where the sun rises in the east. And having the seal of the living God. The seal. In other words, to seal something. He had the seal. Just like the kings of the earth had special seals that they used when they had written messages. And they put that special seal on the message. So you know it came directly from that king and that leader. And God is often portrayed as a king. That's why it says... This messenger has the seal because God is being acting as a king now of the whole earth. And this messenger has that seal. But that's strange. He's rising from the east and he has the seal of God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four messengers. And what did he cry out to them? What did this one messenger cry out? To the four, to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. And he was saying, do not hurt the earth. See, he rose from the east. He had a good message. Do not hurt the earth. Do not let these changes come just yet because something has to be done. Neither the sea and the trees till we have sealed, sealed, protected, sealed. What? The servants of our God upon their brows. <laughs> Very significant. Sealing on God's seal on the brow. Why? It means on. The seal of God, I'm going to explain to you about the seal of God in a second, but on the brow means in the minds, in the consciousness of the servants of God. They must be sealed because they will, they are un to understand the changes and the catastrophes that are about to come. So they must be sealed in their minds and hearts because once it's sealed here, it's through the whole body. And in, in consciousness, in mind, in, in their minds, not brain, in their minds. But this is always, this area here was always the symbol of the mind, this area here. The spiritual mind, this is what it's saying. So he's saying, do, we have to seal them. See, the servants of God upon their brows. And I heard the number of those who were sealed. And it was 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Or the descendants of Israel. Then it mentions the 12 tribes. No, uh, no sense me just reading it. There's, I could tell you different things about the ensigns of these tribes. But uh, we won't use that tonight. Because that's something else. All right. Why 144,000? And so many people <laughs> take this too literally. Let me tell you something. The numbers are also part of the imagery. It does not mean literally 144,000. That's what you, people don't get it when they read the, the book of the Revelation. The number 144,000 is the multiples of the number 12. And it reaches 144,000, which means completeness, absolute totalness. Not literally. You think God can, oh, there's only 144,000 people. How come it happens to work out with the number 12? <laughs> but you don't understand. This is an image, not a literal number. You got it, everyone? Not a literal number. And yet all these different denominations, I've heard them use this 144,000. I've heard <laughs> some of them talk about, well, you know, your membership is more than 144,000. So some of them are not going to make it in. <laughs> oh, what we do here in the West with the Bible is utterly amazing, fantastic, and ridiculous. So it, 
It makes me laugh, but it's serious. It's really serious. So 144,000 is a imagery, a number not to be taken literally. It means a remnant. God always has a remnant. Never literally counted. It just says the multiple, um, the, the 12, but it's the 144,000. And yet, People still take it literally. Now, what does it mean, sealed, the seals in the brow? How does God seal us? How does, and this again is imagery, total imagery. The seal is the teaching of God. What is God's seal? His teaching. It's his teaching. It is the spiritual laws. It is the spiritual principles. It is the spiritual, the spiritual sense of life, the inner sense of life. That's, and this is why the mind, the consciousness is where the seal is, because that's where the teaching is. Hmm? And it's in your heart. You can, we always use this here for just the heart. But in the Bible, the term libba, heart, means divine consciousness, which is in everyone's heart and mind. Here and here, oh, it's, it's everywhere. Remember, I told you the three places that most of our understanding of the mind is not just in the head, it's in the heart and it's in the intestines. In fact, the intestines are often called the second mind. And so <laughs> it, it's, it's the completeness, it's the completeness because from there, everything is sent out to all the cells everywhere. So you have to understand that. So we're sealed by the principles, by the teachings, because that's what holds us in a crisis. The principles and the teachings is the seal of God that holds us in our hearts, in our emotions, and in our feelings, all of that. So do you understand that? And, and the 144,000 simply means a remnant. Even during the time when Israel was doing all kinds of things that were messing everything up, God always had a remnant. So what the revelator is telling us here is that the seal of God, and you can even take it this part, that, that, that some of the many of the tribes of Israel, there was always a remnant who were sealed with the teachings of God. Hmm? But also, you have to take that spiritually as well, which means they are the true Israelites because they have the teaching of God, the principles of God. And now let's read the next verse, the 10th verse. I'm sorry, the ninth verse. After the, all the 12 tribes were sealed, after these things, I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no one could number, in other words, could count, of every nation and people and kindred and tongue language, stood before the throne in the presence of the Lamb, clothed with right white robes with palms in their hand. They're going to sing. They're going to praise God. So this is a multitude. No, it's more than just a remnant. When, when we take in all other nations, all other language, here are more people <laughs> uh, that are, have white robes, have white robes. It's purity. Purity, originality, that's what it's saying here. And they're going to praise God and cried with a loud voice saying, salvation to our God who sits upon the throne and to the lamb. Always the throne authority connected with meekness, lamb. Authority always connected with meekness. Get that folks? Authority connected with meekness. 
when people have authority, what do they generally manifest? Mandate. <laughs> Listen, you obey me or I'll throw you in prison. Authority, true authority is always connected with meekness. Always, always spiritually. Human, give me a rod, but not spiritually. That's why the throne, which represents authority, power, and energy, is always funneled through the lamb. That's why the lamb is right there at the throne. The lamb never leaves the throne, which is the meekness, the pliability, the understanding. The, it's totally different. The laws that are given, the spiritual laws that are given, the authority, the power, and the energy manifest through meekness. Beautiful. This is so beautiful. But you never hear it that way. Okay. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four living creatures. I explained those to you before. I don't, I'm not going to do it anymore. And fell before his throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen. And not it is so. What the amen means faithfulness. Faithful. Faithful is God. Faithful is what he has done. Now, the seven things they're crying out. Blessings, one. Glory, two. Wisdom, three. Thanksgiving, four. Honor, five. Power, six. And might, seven. Always oh, seven, don't you see? always seven this is what they're praising god power, blessing and glory and wisdom and that giving and honor and energy that word power means energy and might to our god from the ages throughout all the ages forever and ever that's what it is ages without end and one of the elders answered saying to me who are these who are arrayed in white robes? And from where do they come? And I said to him, my Lord, you know, you know. And he said to me, these, <laughs> now the man's going to tell him because he already knew. These are those who came out from the great tribulation. The great tribulation. And I know how, the, how they preach the great tribulation. But it means those who have suffered because those who adopted the teachings of Jesus do suffer. They do suffer. And it's talking about all the sufferings here. Spiritually, this means that you have earned your white robes when you have cleansed yourself and you get on white robes and you go through suffering when you go through cleansing. But here, though, it meant and it, it, it's true. This did happen for a thousand years. I'm talking about after Christ. For a thousand years, a little over a thousand years, the Eastern Christians spread all over the earth, clear into China and into the and into Genghis Khan and Kublai Khan and the Mongols, completely all in there. Uh, that's how far it spread. It was victorious. In fact, the Mongols helped. They accepted this form of Christianity, not Western Christianity. This is Eastern Christianity. And they had accepted it. And when the, the Mongols came into Jerusalem and into Baghdad and all that, and they what they were after, they were after the Muslims. And that's what they did. And they, oh, it was a terrible slaughter, just awful. At then, toward the end of that is when persecutions began to shift and go towards those who were going to be martyred in the, among the Christian groups. If you know the history, see, most of our histories are taught in churches and in schools and in, in, in seminaries, all that. They always talk about Western 
history, the Roman Catholic faith and all the things that happened there. We, we, we don't know. We are not taught about what happened in the Near East and about all how Christianity spread throughout the Silk Road and clear to the Mongols and to the into China and into Japan. You never hear about that. But we have evidence now. When I used to first lecture about this, <laughs> I had no books to back it. Now I do. But during those times, and Lamza too, they, they try to make fun of him. Oh, you don't know what you're doing. There's no such thing as Assyrian people. They're all dead and gone. You're not even an Assyrian. <laughs> now that's all changed now. But when I started it, and I'm talking about in the 19. 60s is when I started this. 1962 is when I began to teach all this in San Antonio, Texas at Calvary Missionary Church, and I began to teach it all over the state of Texas and in Austin and Dallas and in Houston and in Corpus Christi, everywhere, all the major cities. And, and I used to get a lot of flack, and even when I used to be on radio or TV, because most people are not educated in this because it's not even taught in the seminaries. You might get it at, at uh, Harvard and Yale and some of the big universities and Princeton to some of these others, but even then they were sitting on it, but now they can't. It's too much of a flood of, of historical records coming to life now. And so now we have more history to back it. But when I first started, it was rough. It was rough because people are, are used to what they've been hearing all their life. As one woman told me when she came to hear me teach, she said, you know, I expected a good Sunday school message. You didn't say anything I believe. <laughs> I had to laugh and I blessed her. I said, I said, but if you already know everything, why should you come and hear me? You just want to get confirmed in your belief. That's all you want. <laughs> that's not learning anything you're not learning anything you're not growing you're not maturing <laughs> and uh, i just laughed because i thought that is amazing that's just like us I mean, it's just like us <laughs> to, to say and do things like that so now you get understanding you understand this here came out from the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb Therefore, let me tell you, if you're washing your robes in blood, it's not going to turn out white. It's going to turn out red. This is all symbolic speech. Therefore, imagery. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne shelters them. And they sh they shall hunger no more because they're satisfied. Remember, they're sealed. They're wearing a white robe and they're sealed. They're, they'll not hunger because they're satisfied. You know, when, you're, when, you, you, when you don't feel hungry, you know, you don't have that hunger. It's really talking about hunger when you're famished. It's because you're constantly being fed. You're constantly, that's why you have no more hungers because you're being fed and satisfied. And then when it comes to eat again, then you need to eat because if you only when you're hungry, right? So you're always fed. That means you'll always be fed. You will hunger no more means you'll always be fed truth. You'll always be fed and satisfied. Hmm? That's all it means. It's, it's just, again, uh, an image and neither thirst anymore. It's terrible to thirst, especially the Near East, when it was hard to get water in the in those days. So never thirst. What a tremendous promise. And and neither shall they be stricken by the sun. You know, burned up by the sun, nor by the heat <laughs> when it gets too hot. This is all imagery. The sun's still going to shine and we need the sun. Your body needs the sun. You need to get some of those sun rays on you. Don't be worried about breaking out with something on the sun. Too much of it? Yes. This is all symbolic speech. 
and the lamb who is in the midst of the throne, he's in the right in the center of the throne, will shepherd them, means guidance. You'll always have guidance. The lamb will always guide you. The teachings of Jesus will always guide you and shall lead them to fountains of living water. Water that is constantly clear, constantly clean, something you can drink. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, which means even though you may suffer some things, although you may hurt, you may suffer loss, you mean the truth that imbibes in you and because of being guided by the lamb, God wipes away all your tears. Hmm? In other words, you start to cry and he wipes away because the truth wipes away those tears doesn't stop you from crying, but they can be wiped. Hmm? Wipe away. Did, did you feel when someone's comforting you? It's comfort. Wiping away tears is comfort. When someone else comes and wipes your tears, hmm? and that's why it says God, it means comforting. God will always be comforting you in the midst of your sorrows, in the midst of your pain, in the midst of the God will always be comforting you. I'm telling you this. This is what it means here. God will comfort you. Now, this is the interlude is coming to a conclusion. And we're coming now, according to the way they wrote it here in the, the way they broke the chapters up. In chapter eight, this is the final end of the interlude. What ends the interlude? And when he opened the seventh seal, remember there were seven seals on that scroll. This is the last seal. The seventh seal is to be pulled apart. Hmm? Pulled apart. He's breaking it. The seventh seal. What happened? There was silence in the sky for about the space of half an hour. Again, just, just imagery. In other words, total silence. What's going to happen? When this seal was broken, there was no imagery at first, but silence total silence quiet even all the praises and everything that was done to god everything shut down total silence in the ancient heavenly temple that he's seeing in his imagery in this temple in this heavenly temple you think heaven has a temple it doesn't have a temple this is all and god doesn't have a throne please those are all imagery god has no throne upon which to sit so this is all imagery, Near Eastern imagery of these people in those days, 2,000 years ago. So here, it's silence. It's like a form of meditation. You're expecting. And it says for about 30 minutes, okay? About total silence. Something is getting ready to be seen, to be felt. And this is where we are closing tonight. <laughs> the second, I'm gonna give you now the verses for the third vision, because the third vision starts with verse two. After the silence, now something's going to emerge. Imagery is going to emerge again, and we're gonna get a different picture different and something's going to happen i'll just read the, the second verse to show you but let me give you the the absolute verses again in case you don't know it verse three starts with chapter eight beginning with verse two and concludes with chapter 11 so we're going to go eight nine ten eleven 
four chapters for this third vision. The major, I'm talking about major vision. The major visions. And it concludes at verse 18. So it's 8, 2 to eleven eighteen. But within this, I'm going to read that second verse. Then I saw seven messengers. Oh, we've gone back to angels again. Messengers who stood before God. And seven trumpets were given to them. So now after seven seals, now we have seven trumpets. Now trumpets means the shofar. <laughs> the, I know the pictures we see, we see these long trumpets and, and the little sound thing here. No, it's, it's the, the, the ram's horn is what they're using here. When it says the shofar, there were seven shofar given to them. Hmm? And you have to think Near Eastern, not trumpets like we know today or like they had even in Rome. But this is in among these Near Eastern people in the world of Israel. And even, um, even though he is supposed to be on the Greek island there of Patmos, but he's still seeing and thinking Easternly. And so these shofars were given him. Uh, you know what I'll do next week? I'll bring down, I have a shofar and I'll bring it to you, show you the seven trumpets that they were blowing on. I have one right upstairs. I didn't think about it tonight because I didn't think I would get to the second verse, but I did. So I will bring it next week and show it to you so you can really see what they were blowing, <laughs> calling it trumpet. Don't think of our modern trumpets, okay? And so now seven of these are going to sound. And blowing into the trumpet and making it a sound, me, the tr all these shofars were used for announcements. When the shofar was turned up, it meant we were victorious if they'd been to a war. If it's turned down and they're blowing it, it means we were defeated. But this is going to make a special announcement. These seven trumpets are going to make so the seventh seal the seventh seal turned loose the seven trumpets and we will start with that next week okay so i'm going to answer some of your questions i hope you put it on the chat so i can see if you've had any questions all right let me go to them Ah, uh, okay. Do the four animals symbolically become the four horses or do they remain separate? No, 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 no. They have nothing to do with the four horses. They are in contrast. The four horses are in contrast to the four living creatures. Hmm? And I, I taught that. You have to go back and, and hear it again. In other words, they are the answer. The answer, they are not the same. They don't become the four horsemen at all, the four horses, not at all. The four living creatures are the answer to war and death and all those other things that the four horses brought. They are the answer to it, the, the antidote, the remedy. That's how you have to understand it. They don't become it, okay? I hope that's clear for you now. All right, let's go to the next question. God doesn't punish. What is the meaning of Moses striking the rock? And God doesn't punish. What is the meaning? No, no, we punish ourselves. Striking the rock in Numbers 20, 11. Striking the rock means to find the hidden well. What, when it says strike the rock, if it isn't whack it and water came out, it means there was, when hidden wells always had a special rocky stone hiding it and then sand over it because the wells were hidden because special tribes used those hidden wells. And in the desert, there are many hidden wells. God showed that it came by revelation to Moses where to strike. And he had the tribes strike 
the stone means to uncover and lift and lift the stone where the hidden well was. And if, if you read other scriptures, they have not just in, in, in numbers, but it says they sing a song, spring up, oh well, spring up, not, oh well, come out of the rock, oh well, come out of the rock. <laughs> it means that the hidden well would be found. And that's, that's the miracle. The miracle is Moses found that spiritually. He divined without divining sticks. It was he himself divined and found the hidden water. So he said, strike there. And, you know, if they would strike and it would just, there was no rockiness, no rock striking the rock, but sand, that means no well. There's no well there. It's when they strike the rock that there's the hidden well. Okay. Uh, we are blessed to have mystic teachings what is a mystic whatever teaching us the true teachings of jesus <laughs> okay all right let's see hello what does the second coming of christ <laughs> what does the second coming of christ mean oh that's a big subject uh, to put it simply to come in the clouds mean to be victorious got it to succeed and once these teachings succeeds, that this again is imagery. When Jesus said, you'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of glory, which means his teachings have succeeded. He's in glory. He is in absolute glory. Coming in the clouds of glory. Because the highest thing in those ancient world, above the mountains, above everything else, were clouds. So when you ride the clouds and coming on clouds, means arriving on the clouds, coming in the clouds, means you have succeeded in your mission. That's the simplest way I can put it without going into detail the way we hear it preached all the time. So that's, the, I, there is more to it, but I've given you an, something to think about, okay? So that's what it means. Second coming of Christ. We call it second coming. That's our terminology. It, it simply means the Christ has never stopped. The Christ never left. We're talking about the Messiah here. Never left. So that's what that means. All right. Uh, where to read the history of the Near East? One of one of the books I would recommend, and I don't have it down here, somewhere on my shelf here. Get the book, The Lost History of Christianity. You can get it on Amazon. The Lost history of christianity years ago i had no books to back and i have several other books here too but i, I that's one of them that i read because i recommend because it'll give you an overall view the lost history of christianity that's the exact title i'm sorry i forgot the author's name all right please don't forget the question about what jesus meant when he said you shall love the lord your god with all your mind and the I don't remember that question. Because everything is based on love. When you love God with all your heart and mind, you, you'll fulfill it. When you love something, when you love someone, you fulfill it. You fulfill that love. And, and this is what it's saying. In other words, your relationship with God is based on love, not on legalism. It's based on love. Love, and even though it says you shall love, as we, we say, because that's what they said, you shall love. But in Aramaic, that tense, that particular tense, you shall love, or you will love the Lord, your God, with all your... I don't translate it that way. I give it because it's a polite way of speaking in Aramaic when they use that particular tense will shall all that it, it, this is it's a peculiar there are two tenses in aramaic one's called perfect and the other's called imperfect and this particular verb that's used with you shall love the lord and in hebrew is the same way and what i'm going to tell you this hebrew is exactly the same two tenses perfect and imperfect and you have to understand how to translate that imperfect verb here i would translate it not you shall love the Lord your God, but I would translate it, love 
the Lord your God with all your mind. Let all your thoughts be centered around God. And with all your heart, with all your emotion. Hmm? Then that, that's true. When you really love something, isn't your thought there? Isn't you, aren't your feelings there? Hmm? You, they're there, right? You can't help it. So loving the Lord your God with all your heart means you'll love truth. You'll love compassion. You'll love peace. You'll love understanding. You'll love what God is. Hmm? And therefore, you will express it. That's why. That's the simplest way I can express that. And again, where does Jesus teach about holding emotions and feelings in heart and how to do this? No, Jesus doesn't say to hold it in your, in your emotions. Huh. Where does Jesus teach about holding emotions? In your, no, he doesn't talk like we do here in the West. Huh? When, when he talks about loving God with all your heart, that, that, that's your emotions. That's what you are, right? Love. Love is a proper attitude and feeling. Okay? I follow along in my African Bible where you are reading. It is interesting to me that the Africans translate is close to the original Aramaic, which that doesn't surprise me. Then to the English translation, exactly. I got it as a gift from my parents in 1962. And the translation was done in 1957. I do have one, but I don't know if it's the same one. I'll have to look and see. I do have one. But I basically more or less use the Aramaic. And even though sometimes I wasn't with Dr. Lamzer when he was making his translation of the Bible. I was a little kid. so. <laughs> I, and he didn't finish it until 19, 1957 is when he finished it. And, and he had it at the World's Fair. Hmm? Okay. Thank you, doctor. Love your classes. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. The question is what Jesus understood by heart and mind and soul. Well, I explained that. You, uh, when you, you understand by heart. It, but in the ancient world, heart means your full being and mind is your thoughts and your soul is yourself the soul is the self the word for soul in aramaic is ne nausha in hebrew nefesh nefesh and it means the self the being i can translate it as being well, the reason we use soul is because we it comes from the greek and that's why we use soul but it, in aramaic it means the self, the absolute core and center of you. That's what it means. Okay. In Aramaic and in Hebrew. But we always borrow from the Greek. Now, I know you have more questions here, but there's one that, that I was supposed to do last week that I got uh, as an email. And I do want to answer it before I get to some more. And it says, um, this one is, um, it says here, I'm interested to know what Dr. Erico says about the scripture that says about a camel going through the eye of a needle. And what she, what this person did was send me a link to see these other scholars, which I already know. I've heard those scholars explain exactly what was on that TV many times. And Dr. Lamza did too. When Dr. Lamza, when before I was even working with Dr. Lamza, who translated the Bible and translate, it's, it's the scripture in Matthew 19, 24. It's also in Luke. And in 1924, it says he, it's easier for a camel to go through a knee, needle eye than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, first of all, you can never, ever get a camel through a needle's eye. And Jesus would not do such a ridiculous form of expression. And what I did when this was sent to me, and Dr. Lamza wrote this himself in his book, this one right here, Aramaic Light on the Gospel of Matthew, a commentary on the teachings of Jesus from the Aramaic and unchanged Eastern customs. He, the first one he did was in 1936. And um, 
I worked on him for this new edition, worked with him for the, this new edition, and I added more in it because the original edition had all four gospels and only 400 pages. And when I worked on it with Dr. Lamb said, plus what I've added, just Matthew now has 400 pages, okay? Gamla is an Aramaic word for camel, rope, and bean. One determines the exact meaning of the word by its context. If the word writing on a, if the word riding or burden appears, gamla would definitely mean a camel. But when the eye of a needle appears in the phrase, the word gamla more correctly means a rope. See, he doesn't go into what these scholars do. He's going by his customs and not by the, what the scholars quoted. And the one who wrote me this question knows what I'm talking about. What the scholars say about a certain Aramaic speaking church father that wrote about certain things. And also among the Greeks, the Greeks also sometimes use the word rope, a mooring rope going through the, the needle eye there by the, the, where they're tying the boat. But it, that's not the case. Either of those cases is not the thing. When I was lecturing in, in, when I was actually living in California and they called me on a Sunday morning to do a special TV show with Jewish rabbis, and with uh, a Greek priest, and, and I represented the Aramaic, and there was a fundamentalist, and, they, and this idea about the, the camel going through a needle's eye in the scripture, and I brought that out, and the Greek brought it out about the mooring rope, and of course, the fundamentalist didn't believe anything we had to say, and <laughs> the Jewish man also agreed with what I said in Aramaic. And I tell you what was how how it should be understood. And this is why I'm reading Dr. Lamza right now. And he says, uh, when they when they would do certain things like this, he says, there's nothing in Aramaic literature where they ever compared a camel with a needle's eye. Nowhere. And there's a reason for it. And why did Jesus use it? Because they translated the word gamla, which can mean a camel, a rope, and a beam. The beam and the roof. He says, the word gamla is also used in Matthew, in another scripture, Matthew 23, 24. But here it means a camel because Jesus was talking about bak, a gnat, and comparing, contrasting it with a camel. In this case, both objects were alive and the hyperbole was justified. You cannot justify the hyperbole of a camel and a needle's eye, not in the Aramaic language. Can't do it. So uh, it makes sense when it says a gnat and a camel because the, the hyperbole, they balance each other. Everyone in the Near East knows that a camel can never pass through a needle's eye but that a rope might at least be forced through a very large needle when making tents. Okay. A rope can easily be threaded through the eye of a large wooden needle used for making rugs and tents, but some parts of the rope would fray and other parts would pass through the needle. Rich men can enter God's kingdom, providing they place God first and share their wealth with others. Rich men are God's trustees. They are entrusted with wealth to be used for the good of all of God's children. For one man has been entrusted with, for one man has been trusted with wisdom, another with money, another with power to heal, another to do their very six among different gifts among men, humanity. Another with the power to heal, etc. Said so they all are God's stewards, distributing in the abundance of God to everyone. Such expressions as rope and needle, camel and gnat are common in Semitic tongue. But the comparison or contrast must have some connection, or the illustration would be meaningless. The repetition of some Aramaic words in widely differing Context is largely due to limited vocabulary. 
Aramaic is an ancient language and the gospels were written at a time when language did not require an extensive vocabulary and new ideas were not prevalent. I, I just read just a little bit of it. There's a lot more in here, but that should answer your question. The one that wrote in and asked me that. All right. I see the time is catching up with me. Uh, let me see what this is here. The lost history of Christianity, the thousand year golden age of the church in the Middle East, Africa, Asia, and how it died. Oh, there's that, that's it. Philip Jenkins, there it is right there. Someone sent it in. Thank you. Uh, and then the thank you to Philip. Okay. All right, that takes care of all the questions. I have one more thing to tell you. Aramaic School of Light starts again in September. So September 10th, September 10th uh, is the first class session on Saturday. That's Saturday from one until three Eastern time. And I'm speaking on Jesus son of man, son of God. And I purposely did it. Jesus on top, son of man, son of God. That's going to be in three parts for September, October, and November. So it'll be six hours altogether with those three months. So I want you to put it down for September 10th, one o'clock Eastern time, and it's on Jesus. And you've never heard what I'm going to be teaching I have not released this, what I'm going to be to some of it, you will know, but I'm going to be teaching a lot of new things. I'm going to develop what it means when it says son of man. That's how the Bible declares Jesus, son of man. Jesus used it himself. He used that term constantly. What did he mean by that? And how do we understand it? And when did Jesus know that he was son of God? How did he know it? What took place in him? What happened to him? Do we know? Yes, there are hints of it all through the Gospels, but you have to find it and know what it is. So I'm speaking on Jesus in a different way than you've ever heard before. It's, of course, always based on Aramaic, always based on the Gospels, and based on the Near Eastern custom and understanding how Jesus came in his own mind and heart to understand how he was an expression of God. Hmm? This is the son of God. So it's Jesus, son of man, son of God, starting that first class is September 10th. And I only do one a month, September 10th. Then there'll be one in the second Saturday in October and the second Saturday in November. And then I have a surprise. In December, we're going to have a Christmas get together on the second Saturday for the two hours where you're going to meet with all of us. And I'm, and I'm going to tell you some things about Dr. Lamza and, and you can express yourself too. It's going to be a time of fellowship. Let's celebrate Christmas. I can't be with you actually fully physically. And I can't, you know, you can't be with me like I used to have seminars and classes we're going to do something then instead of a class in December and on the second Saturday, we're going to have a get together. OK, and I'll discuss that more as the time comes for that in December. So it's new things are going to be happening. And I've got a lot of new things that are going to be starting on the new year, too. So. Uh, I want to say thank you for this evening and and we appreciate you sending in your offerings to keep this program going. And to keep the foundation going, they, they, we appreciate that very much. And I thank you. And I love you and appreciate you. And I know God is blessing you always. Love you, everyone. See you next week.